Fantastic. Hello, everyone. It is my great honor to introduce our CBCB seminar speaker for today, Dr. Kerry Geiler Samorot, who has throughout her career been producing truly fundamental research in the interface of biochemistry and molecular evolution. She did her PhD with Alan Drummond and Daniel Hartle, during which time she quantified for the first time the collateral effects of mutations, discovering in particular that misfolding proteins impose a fitness cost that is dosage dependent and elucidating the cellular mechanisms responding to this uh, fitness defect. Fitness defect. And for this discovery, she was awarded the very prestigious Walter Finch Award at the, by the Society for Molecular, Evolution, Molecular Biology and Evolution in 2011. After finishing her graduate studies, she went on to do a postdoc first with Mark Seagal at NYU and then with Dmitry Petrov at Stanford University. And throughout her postdoc work, she has made really profound advances into our understanding of the complexity of how co context affects genotype-phenotype relationships with very, very interesting implications for the concepts of pleiotropy and diversity. She, these achievements have led her to start her own her position at Arizona State University in, as a faculty member in 2019, where she continues to study the complexity of genotype environment phenotype, 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 phenotype fitness relationships, to quote her title, and uh, has uh, received a number of awards, including recently the Sloan Research Fellowship in Computational and Evolutionary Biology. And before I hand the mic to our esteemed speaker, I want to encourage you all to follow Dr. Gaylor Samorot on Twitter, because she has launched a very exciting open science campaign and if you follow her, you can follow laboratory evolution experiments in real life for a very fun mix of science, wet lab tips, and a lot of humor. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gaila Samorot. Thank you so much for that introduction and, and thanks for having me here to talk to you all about my work. Uh, like, like Anne says, my name is Carrie Gaila Samorati and I'm an assistant professor in the Center for Mechanisms of Evolution, and that's at Arizona State University, where it's a balmy 85 or, or 90 today. <laughs> and so what I'm going to talk to you about today is my interest in the genotype phenotype map. I, I almost, I don't know, it's, it's almost difficult to tell people what I'm interested in and tell them that I'm interested in this map because this word means so many different things to so many different people. I think a lot of scientists actually study the genotype phenotype map. So some scientists are interested in identifying genetic changes that allow bacteria or tumors or viruses to become drug resistant. Other scientists are interested in mapping the genetic changes that allow organisms to adapt to climate change and still others are interested in mapping the genetic changes that contribute to our health or human disease. So the key to understanding what my research group does is understanding that we're not necessarily interested in mapping any particular phenotype. We're more interested in the map itself. And we think that by understanding the structure of this map, we might be able to get to better models about how evolution works. So today I'm going to talk about kind of a hot question with regard to this map which is how many phenotypes does a genetic change tend to affect? So we know that when a single genetic change influences multiple phenotypes, it's called pleiotropy. And there's actually a pretty big debate about how much pleiotropy we should expect to find in nature. On one side of the debate, you have evolutionary theory, which tells us that natural selection should act to limit pleiotropy. So for example, if you have a population of yeast cells, that are under selection to become bigger, and you have a mutation that makes those cells bigger, you might have a, another mutation that can make those cells bigger, but also messes with the cell membrane. There might be yet another mutation that makes those cells bigger, but also changes their shape. Natural selection is going to tend to choose the least um, pleiotropic mutation. The reason for this being that the more phenotypes the genetic change affects, the more likely it is that one of these effects is going to be negative. 
And this is sometimes called the cost of complexity. More simply put, I'll call it the cost of pleiotropy. And there are plenty of examples in the literature that demonstrate this cost by showing that selection tends to choose less pleiotropic over more pleiotropic changes. So here's a paper from Patricia Whitcock. It shows that natural selection tends to choose cis-regulatory changes that affect the expression of a single gene over trans-regulatory changes that affect the expression of many genes. Here's a paper from Erica Letters Group that shows that um, the changes that help fish adapt to temperature change tend to be in genes that contribute to few biological processes rather than high pleiotropy genes. And there are a number of papers that suggest that over long periods of evolutionary time, this type of selection will actually change the way the genotype phenotype map is organized, encouraging a modular structure where the genetic changes that affect one group of traits have minimal impact system-wide. On the other side of the debate, you have quantitative geneticists who, despite this idea that natural selection should act to limit pleiotropy, just keep on finding tons and tons of pleiotropy. So they find that overlapping sets of genetic variants contribute to seemingly disparate neurological systems and digestive system some symptoms and immunological symptoms. In cancers and microbes, they find that the same genes contribute to growth in really different environments or in different drugs. A view emerging from these types of studies is that genetic variation in complex traits is omnigenic in the sense that many genes contribute to variation in many traits. And this is reminiscent of Fisher's universal pleiotropy model, where every gene affects literally every phenotype, at least to some vanishingly small degree. And so as it stands, there's a big, at times pretty heated debate, not only about how much pleiotropy we should expect to see in nature, but also about the structure of the genotype phenotype map and whether it's very modular or whether it's very interconnected such that genetic changes affect many things at once. So you might be thinking, okay, like this is easy to resolve, just count how many phenotypes genetic changes affect. And that's actually complicated for a lot of reasons. But one is that even within a single cell, there might be an almost immeasurable number of phenotypes to count. Like there's the expression level of every gene, the position of every nucleosome, the quantity of every metabolite. And what's more is that these things are all related in complex ways. And so we don't really understand how genetic changes make molecular level changes and how these kind of percolate to higher functional levels. And this all matters to a lot of fields. It matters for evolutionary biologists because we wanna be able to look at a mutation and predict whether it's gonna be beneficial and rise to high frequency or whether it's gonna be deleterious. We wanna predict high level things. In the field of medicine, we also wanna be able to predict, oh, this mutation, that's bad. It predisposes you to disease. And all these predictions are a lot more complicated if genetic changes do lots and lots of different things. And we have to sort of put all of that information together to make a final prediction on, on if it's good or bad. And so the projects I'll tell you about today tackle this question of trying to count how much pleiotropy there is in the genotype phenotype map with the hope that there won't be a lot of it and so that it will be easier to comprehensively map um, genetic changes to phenotypic changes. All right, so unfortunately, both both projects don't find that. They find that there is a lot of pleiotropy in the map. But on the bright side, both of these projects, I'll tell you about some ways that we were still able to make predictions of phenotype from genotype, despite all of this pleiotropy. And as extra icing on the cake, I'll tell you about kind of a, a loophole that we discovered that might be able to explain for the first time why pleiotropic genetic variants are able to escape this cost of complexity or cost of pleiotropy and accumulate in genomes. So in this first project, I'm gonna focus on measuring the relationships between phenotypes to try and be able to make predictions about which phenotypes we expect will be jointly affected by genetic changes. This is a project that I worked on with Mark Siegel at NYU, along with a number of graduate student and undergraduate and high school trainees. It started because we're trying to map the genetic basis of differences in single cell morphology 
between yeast isolated from a wine barrel and yeast isolated from soil near an oak tree. And these yeasts look pretty different. The wine cells are very round. The oak cells are more elongated. The wine cells sometimes have these gigantic weird nuclei and the oak cells seem to have consistently small nuclei. So our goal was to conduct a QTL screen to look for the genetic basis of these differences. And fortunately, the lab that isolated these strains from nature had already made a QTL mapping family. So they mated the wine yeast to the oak yeast to create an F1 hybrid. Then they sporulated that hybrid to create about 400 F2 recombinants. And they also genotyped those recombinants all along the genome. So to find a region of the genome that contributes to differences in morphology, what you do is you pick a region of the genome, take all the guys that inherited the wine allele there and put them in one bin, and take all the guys that inherited the oak allele and put them in another bin. And then you ask if there are morphological differences between those two bins. And if there are, you say, great, that region of the genome contributed to that difference in morphology. And that's how QTL screen works. So here I'll show you the results from our QTL screen. The vertical axis is every one of the morphological phenotypes that the software that I use measures. So there are about 150 of these phenotypes. And the horizontal axis is the yeast genome organized by chromosome. So when you see a point on this plot, it means there's a region in the genome here on chromosome eight that contributes to a difference in the bud radius between the vine and the oak strain. And here's another region in the genome, also called a QTL and chromosome 16, that contributes to a difference in the brightness of the nuclear stain between the vine and the oak strains. And now here's a pleiotropic region in the genome on chromosome 13. It affects two traits. And here's all of the QTL effects that I found. And you can see I found some QTL that are just extremely pleiotropic. They contribute to upwards of 20 traits. This QTL contributes to a variation in 73 morphological traits. QTL represent large regions of the genome. And so it's possible that within this region, there are multiple genes, each of which is less pleiotropic. But at least for this QTL I'm showing you, that's not the case. We narrowed its effect down to a single gene called HOF1 that affects 73 morphological features. And so this is bizarre um, because I'm an evolutionary biologist and I know that natural selection is supposed to limit the amount of pleiotropy in nature. The reason being that if you have a gene that affects 73 traits, it's very hard to modify one of those traits without accidentally modifying 72 others. It would be like if you had a stereo and you were trying to change the bass and every time you turned that dial, the dial for treble also turned and the volume changed and the track that was playing changed. It would just be really difficult to get to the right settings if every time you turned one dial, others simultaneously turned. I think that's the most intuitive explanation I can give you for why pleiotropy is costly. And yet despite this cost, I'm seeing a lot of it. So why? One reason may be that the traits that I study are related. And so two of the traits I study are cell area and cell circumference. Now, barring changes in cell shape, when you increase cell area, you're necessarily increasing cell circumference. And so is it really fair to call a gene that affects these two traits pleiotropic? It, you can just call these traits cell size and say, I've taken two redundant measures of it. And this sounds like a trivial example, so let me give you a better one. So it turns out that the mutation that makes tomatoes ripen to a nice uniform red color also makes them taste bland. And so by selecting for pretty tomatoes, farmers accidentally selected for bad tasting tomatoes. And on the surface, that sounds like pleiotropy, but actually this mutation has a single effect. It dials down chloroplast development and that percolates onwards to affect sugar and pigment accumulation. So cases like these where you have a genetic change that affects multiple related traits are sometimes referred to as fake or spurious or vertical pleiotropy. On the other hand, when you have a genetic change that affects independent traits, this is sometimes called real or true, genuine, horizontal pleiotropy. Horizontal pleiotropy is the kind that we think natural selection should be able to eliminate from nature. Um, but problematically, it's very difficult to tell these types of pleiotropy apart. And that's because um, 
Well, you could tell them apart in the absence of genetic variation, perhaps. But what happens is in the presence of genetic variation, all of traits appear related. And the reason why is if you have a genetic variant acting via horizontal pleiotropy, let's say it affects cell size and nucleus size. Well, if you inherit that variant, you're gonna have a big cell and a big nucleus. It's gonna look like those traits are related, but they're not inherently related. The genetic variant is acting on independent traits to make them appear related. So it's difficult to disentangle these two types of pleiotropy. And thus it's difficult for us to understand how good of a job selection is doing to eliminate one type of pleiotropy in nature. So the real way forward then would be to try and study pleiotropy in the absence of genetic variation. And we just happen to have the data set that lets us do this because we're studying um, single cell traits Hello. I'm sorry, it appears uh, that we have lost the speaker. Oh, Kerry. I don't know what happened there. Um, you have a perfect phenotype of huh? single cell traits. That's where we lost you. Okay, let me, uh, let me try that again. Thank you. Did you see why these cells might be different? Yes. So these slides, okay. Okay, so our plan, now that we have these clonal cells is to measure all of their morphological phenotypes and see which phenotypes are inherently related. Like cell area and cell circumference are obviously inherently related because of a geometric constraint. And there may be other traits that are inherently related because of the way genetic networks are wired. And so now we finally have a way to probe which traits are inherently related and maybe use that to make predictions about which traits will be jointly affected by a QTL and which traits should not be jointly affected unless there's true pleiotropy going on. So the first thing we can ask is, are most of the traits we measure related? And the answer is no. The median correlation between pairs of traits is 0.1. Now we can say, okay, do QTL tend to affect traits that are related? And the answer is yes. Here's a QTL on chromosome two. It affects a single pair of traits and they have very strong correlation, 0.75. Here's another QTL on chromosome two. It affects many pairs of traits and on average, those traits are more strongly related to one another than you would expect if you randomly sampled from the full distribution. So by and large, our QTL are tending to affect related traits, and that's the definition of vertical pleiotropy. So a lot of the pleiotropy in our system is vertical. Another cool thing here, besides just being able to pinpoint what type of pleiotropy we're looking at, is also that this method that we developed to quantify inherent relationships between traits gives us a little bit of predictive power to say, oh, these traits are inherently correlated. Well, now we can guess that they're more likely to be influenced by a genetic change. And so any degree of predictability in this genotype phenotype map makes me pretty happy. Okay, now I wanna move past pairwise analysis to get to a big question about the genotype phenotype map, which is, is it modular? Our data literally let us paint a picture of how modular it is. And we can do that by creating force-directed networks where every node is one of our traits and the edge between nodes represents the strength of the correlation between traits. And what you can see in these networks is what looks like a bit of modularity. You can see a module here, a cluster here, another one here. We can calculate a clustering coefficient for every node to ask how much modularity is in this network. And what this plot is showing you is that in the network on the left, the clustering coefficients are higher than they would be in permuted networks where you randomly mix up which edge goes with which pair of nodes. 
And so this network is indeed more modular than you would expect by chance. Now you can see if there's any predictive power. Are QTL more likely to affect traits that are um, within the same module? And the answer seems to be yes, QTL tend to affect modules of traits. So let me sort of make a pit stop here and give you a summary of what I've told you so far. So the first thing we learned is that the strength of the correlations between a pair of traits can predict to some extent whether those traits are likely to be affected by the same genetic variant. And the second thing we learned is that these traits seem to have a modular organization, which can also predict to some extent which traits will be jointly affected by the same QTL. So by precisely quantifying the inherent relationships between phenotypes and clonal cells, we uncovered this potential opportunity to make predictions about the genotype phenotype map. Another major conclusion so far is that a lot of the pleiotropy I was looking at is indeed vertical pleiotropy. But there are some hints of horizontal pleiotropy here. For example, not every point in this plot is above the red line. So you can see there's some pairs of traits that have almost no correlation, a zero correlation, and yet they're jointly affected by the same QTL. That's the definition of horizontal pleiotropy when a gene influences independent traits. And also there's these sort of tantalizing cases where a QTL influences two modules that aren't very strongly connected. So now I wanna dive a little deeper into horizontal pleiotropy. This is the type of pleiotropy that natural selection should be able to purge from genomes because it's not sort of an unavoidable consequence of the way the system is wired. So to detect horizontal pleiotropy, a method we use is based on the intuition that horizontal pleiotropy should cause independent traits to appear related. Let me give you a toy example of that. So imagine you have a genetic variant that affects cell size and cell shape. In yeast cells that inherit the oak version of that variant, maybe they have a small size and shape, but in the cells that inherit the wine version, they have a larger size and shape. In both these cell populations, size and shape are not very correlated, but across the merged population, these two traits appear to have a stronger correlation. That's how horizontal pleiotropy um, increases the correlation between traits. So I just wanna be very clear before I was talking about how traits correlate in the absence of genetic variation, and I'm never gonna talk about that again. Now I'm talking about how traits correlate across genetically distinct strains. So to detect horizontal pleiotropy, the idea is for every QTL, we're going to partition the strains into whether they inherited the wine or the oak version, and then ask if the trait correlation is decreased in those subpopulations relative to the merged population. And by and large, the answer is usually yes. So in this plot, every point represents a QTL and the vertical axis shows you how much the trait correlation changes um, when you partition by wine or oak subpopulations. And you can see the trait correlations tend to go down. They're mostly below zero. And so indeed, it looks like what these QTL do is they make traits appear to be more correlated in the merged population. This doesn't work when we only study traits that are not affected by these QTL, so it's not some weird artifact of having subset the strains. It appears to really be that QTL act via horizontal pleiotropy. Here's an example. So this is a QTL on chromosome 15. It affects a lot of traits, but two of them are the shape of the mother cell's nucleus and the ratio of the size of the nucleus and the mother to the bud cell. And you can see in the merged population, these two traits are more correlated than in either subpopulation. So about 60% of the traits I study look like this. 40% look really weird because, I don't know, because biology is always there to, to surprise you. And so in 40% of the cases, actually the correlation wasn't the strongest in the merged population. It was the strongest in one of the subpopulations. And so we think what's happening here is that it's, it's not that this QTL is affecting two traits like you would expect for horizontal pleiotropy. It's that this QTL is changing the correlation between traits. So if you inherit the oak version of it, the traits are correlated. But if you inherit the wine version of it, the traits are not that correlated. And so we're not the first ones to find something like this. This is called a RQTL for relationship QTL. But I was surprised at how common it is because I just spent a lot of time really precisely quantifying 
the inherent correlations between traits. I wanted to build these little networks and be able to make predictions about which traits are probably jointly affected by genetic change. And now you're telling me there's all these genetic variants that can basically change the network. They can change those inherent relationships and ruin my predictive power. So of course I wanted to know how common is this type of thing? And um, we found it, it's common enough. Not only genetic changes, but also cell cycle state or the environment can change the relationship between traits. Let me just give you one quick example. So we look to see how often spontaneous mutations can change the relationship between traits. And we did this by studying mutation accumulation lines. So these are 94 yeast limes that uh, have each been allowed to accumulate mutations in the absence of natural selection. And they've been sequenced to show that the mutations they accumulated seems to match the spontaneous mutation spectrum. Each one only accumulated about four mutations though. And so if mutations that alter trait correlations are rare, these lines should all look the same in terms of their trait correlations. So that was the idea, we'll quantify pairwise trait correlations across clonal cells separately in each line. And we'll see if they always match. And they don't. So here are four MA lines in red, purple, green, and blue that have a pairwise trait correlation that differs from all the other lines by over four standard deviations. So for example, here's a pair of traits, the cell circumference and the position of the nucleus. These traits tend to be related. They have a correlation of 0.4 across almost all of the MA lines. And in the ancestor, the unmutated ancestor, these traits are also correlated with the Pearson coefficient of 0.4. But in this weird guy here, it looks like the correlation is broken. So presumably what happened is one of the unique mutations in this purple line disrupted that trait correlation. And it was just pretty impressive to see this at all because we're only studying 400 mutations here. So it's, it can't be that rare that a mutation changes a, straight, a trait correlation if we were able to pick it up. All right, so let me wrap up this whole first project for you. So I told you that we were trying to figure out how much pleiotropy there was in nature. And in a way, we kind of found an intermediate amount. So we did find some evidence that natural selection acts to reduce pleiotropy because we saw that there was a modular structure to the genotype phenotype map. It's not that genetic changes can just seep out and affect every phenotype. There appears to be some modularity. But we also found a lot of pleiotropy and not only vertical pleiotropy, we found horizontal pleiotropy. This is the kind that natural selection should be able to remove. And so, we're not yet able to say things like, oh, this is more horizontal pleiotropy than you should expect. Selection isn't working. What we're really trying to do in this study is just tease it out and say, can we even identify and differentiate horizontal pleiotropy, this elusive thing, true pleiotropy? And so I think this method can tease it out. And now we'll need follow-up studies to be able to see if this amount of horizontal pleiotropy is more than you would expect. It's possible that genetic changes, mutations, create tons of horizontal pleiotropy. And natural selection is indeed constantly removing this from the population. And what we're seeing here is just what slipped under the radar. So we are able to see horizontal pleiotropy. The next step is figuring out uh, exactly how much selection is doing to remove it. Another major take home message to the study is that this new method we created whereby we're able to quantify inherent trait correlations across clones might give us some predictability in the genotype phenotype map, at least for microbial populations where we can actually study clones. And so that's nice because there are a lot of microbes we care about like infectious microbes. But we have to take that predictability with a grain of salt because I showed you that the inherent trait correlations that these predictions are based on can be context dependent. They can change with genetic background they can change upon spontaneous mutation, and they can change across environments. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, context dependence is a little bit of a bummer. It's like, oh man, biology is really complicated. I wanted to make predictions. Like, it would be nice if it would be simple. But on the other hand, by understanding this context dependence, it helps us possibly resolve this debate that I told you about in the beginning of the talk. So it's possible that 
the reason pleiotropic genetic variants can escape the cost of pleiotropy and persist is that maybe they're not pleiotropic in every context. So imagine you have a mutation that affects hundreds of phenotypes. It's super pleiotropic in context A, and you expect that thing to probably not be beneficial because if you affect that many phenotypes, you're probably not affecting them all in a good way. But maybe there's a separate context like environment B where you're only really affecting one phenotype. And in that context, this mutation isn't deleterious and it's allowed to persist. So in this way, context dependence can, can help us understand some of the observations that we make in nature. So to me, the, the unexpected take home message in project one was this observation of context dependence. And it's something that I really wanted to study further. And so in project two, we were also looking at pleiotropy to try and quantify how much pleiotropy is in nature, but this time we were doing it while embracing this idea of context dependence. And what we're actually doing is looking for phenotypic effects of mutation that are hidden in some contexts and thus sort of able to escape the cost of pleiotropy, but then you can reveal them in other contexts. And so the second project is something that I worked on with Grant Kinsler and Dimitri Petrov at Stanford University. And like I said, its focus is similar to the first project in a way. It started out focusing on pleiotropy and on this debate, this idea that evolutionary theory suggests pleiotropy should be limited, but the data suggests pleiotropy is everywhere. And so to make sense of this mismatch between theory and observation, what we did is we added the fitness layer back to the genotype phenotype fitness map. And we did this so we could formalize these ideas about context dependence. So in this model, it's totally okay if a genetic variant is super pleiotropic and affects very many phenotypes, as long as not all of those phenotypes contribute to fitness in a given context. So to go back to the radio dial analogy, it's okay if when you turn one dial on your radio, 72 dials also turn, as long as those 72 dials don't do anything. So to make a more biologically relevant example, it's okay if a mutation cripples your ability to grow in a high salt condition, as long as you're not in a high salt condition. So if you push this new model a little bit further, there are some implications. For example, it means that you could have two genetic variants that affect different sets of phenotypes but they could look very similar to you if you're studying them in a particular context where only certain phenotypes matter to fitness. And you could reveal the differences between these mutants by simply changing the context to reveal what we're calling this latent or hidden phenotypic diversity. A result of this um, is that it makes things more complicated and it may make evolution less predictable. Let me give you a concrete example. So there's this push in the field of medicine to craft what are known as evolutionary traps. And in these traps, you evolve a population of microbes to uh, do well in a certain context, perhaps to resist a drug, all the while knowing that the mutations that allow it to resist that drug are, make it susceptible to a second drug. And so this is called a trap because you get the population right where you want it, and then you put the second drug and you can predict all the mutants are going to die in the second drug. There's evidence that these traps could work coming from high replicate evolution experiments in the lab that tend to show that the mutations that allow microbes to thrive in a particular context are all very similar. They all fall into a handful of genes and those genes are involved in similar biological functions. And so you might expect that what those mutations are doing, even though they're in different genes, is they're just affecting the same phenotype. And because of that, you can predict that all the mutations will respond the same way when you change the environment. But if there's latent phenotypic complexity among these pink adaptive mutants, and some are affecting different phenotypes from others, um, you might not be able to predict what they're gonna do in a new environment. And so this is just one example, but I hope it gives you a concrete example of how this new model that we're proposing uh, matters and is, is different from the classic model where we assume that adaptive mutations affect very few phenotypes because if they affected more phenotypes, they wouldn't be adaptive. They probably have all these negative side effects. So how do we tell these two models apart? 
So our way to do it um, is based on the intuition that, that I kind of told you about. We need to get a lot of mutants and then we need to see if they have latent phenotypic differences. All right, so step one, get a lot of mutants. Ideally, you want a lot of mutants that all evolved in the same context. And so we found a collection of yeast strains that were evolved to contend with glucose limitation. And then these yeast strains ran out of glucose every 48 hours and had to run on fumes until it was replenished. And these yeast strains were evolved by a set of three labs at Stanford. Um, this project was led by Sasha Levy and Jamie Blundell. The yeast that they started with were all genetically identical except for a DNA barcode. And this is a 26 base pair region of DNA that differentiates every strain in the flask. So what they did is they let these yeast strain routinely run out of glucose. Eventually mutations emerged that helped them deal with that situation. These mutations rose to high frequency and took over. And now normally you wouldn't be able to track each of these mutant lineages. You could just tell like in general, this flask was doing better than previously, but the barcodes let you track each individual mutant lineage. And so what you can see here is the increase in every barcode over time. And you can see the red ones are indeed increasing because they received adapted mutations. The slope of that rate of increase is the fitness of that strain, it's fitness advantage. These evolutions were conducted for a very short period of time. So every lineage really only had time to accumulate a single mutation. And what this means is when the researchers went in and fished out 300 lineages and sequenced them, it was really easy for them to say, oh, hey, here's the mutation. Here's the one that gives you the fitness advantage. And so they called this a comprehensive genotype to fitness map of adaptation, which is a super cool accomplishment. There's just one problem. And it's that the phenotype layer is, is missing. And so the researchers say that they think these mutations likely only affect a handful of phenotypes, maybe even one phenotype. And that's because all of these mutations fall into a glucose sensing pathway. And so they probably affect flux through this pathway and that's how they achieve their benefit. There are some nuances here though, like there's actually two glucose sensing pathways, tor seh and RAS-PKA. So maybe there's actually two phenotypes that are affected by this collection of mutants, two classes of phenotype. Or maybe there's a lot of latent phenotypic complexity and every mutant affects a whole bunch of different phenotypes. How do we tell the difference? How do we count the number of phenotypes that these mutants affect? So I suppose we could take every strain and run a battery of phenotyping platforms on it, like RNA-seq perhaps, but that seems like a lot of work and I'm, I'm not sure it would be exhaustive. I said it'd be hard to measure every phenotype in a single cell. So we came up with a different idea and that's that we're gonna try and infer how many phenotypes are affected by these mutants. And the way we do that is sort of based on this intuition that I told you about before. If we have a bunch of mutants that seem similar, we can reveal their latent phenotypic differences by measuring their fitness in new environments. And so, in a way, that's what we did. We took these mutants, we measured their fitness in new environments, and every time a new difference was revealed, we counted it as, okay, there's a new phenotype. Let me, let me show you this a bit better. So for every one of these 300 mutants, we quantified a fitness profile, which represents the way its fitness changes as we vary the environment. If all of these mutants affect the same phenotypes, we expect them all to respond the same way to environmental change and their fitness profiles should have the same shape. But if one of these mutants has latent phenotypic complexity, we expect it to have different gene by environmental interactions and the fitness profile will have a different shape. And so the conceptual leap I want you to make is that by counting the number of different shaped fitness profiles we see, we can infer the minimum number of phenotypes that must be collectively affected by this group of mutants in order to explain that diversity in their fitness profiles. In order for this to work, we need to be able to do a lot of things. We need a lot of mutants because we need to see diversity in fitness profiles. And we need to be able to measure their fitness in a lot of environments. And that would be a tall order, that's a lot of experiments. But we're able to do it because we have DNA barcodes. So we can mix all of the mutants together and then track how their barcodes change in frequency relative to their unmutated ancestor and use that to infer fitness of many mutants at once.
So we did experiments like this in 45 different environments with three replicates each. We tried things like increasing the salt concentration, changing the glucose concentration, changing the time it took for them to get more glucose, trying alternate carbon sources to glucose and adding whatever drug we happened to have in the fridge at the time. We tried lots of different environments. And even with the barcodes, this was a hefty amount of work. So this is something that I worked on with three graduate students, including Grant Kinsler, who is my co-first author on this project, and Yu Ping Li and Sandeep Venkatram, who collected their data for a different project, but generously let us use it. We also had a lot of guest pipetters, and it turned into a little bit of a circus in the lab. And that's how our project on Twitter started, where we said, oh, we're gonna take pictures of us all looking crazy. But then it sort of turned into something more where we talked about hardships in the wet lab and different ways that we tried to improve upon our wet lab procedures. So if you followed us on Twitter, uh, I'm about to tell you what we actually learned from that experiment. And so after we did all the growth competitions, we sequenced all the barcodes and tracked how they changed in frequency over time. What we found unsurprisingly is that fitness changed in different environments. And so on this plot, every point represents the average fitness of all the lineages that had a mutant in a gene called IRA1. And there are 45 points, one for each environment. The key takeaway is that mutations in IRA1 are adaptive in the original glucose limited environment and suffer trade-offs in other environments. And um, here's the data for another type of mutant, the diploid. What you see here is that diploids are nearly universally adaptive in all the environments. Here's data for another mutant, GPB2. This mutant, like IRA1, is a negative regulator of the RAS PKA pathway. And like IRA1, it suffers some trade offs in um, environments that are very different from the original environment. Unlike IRA1, it seems to have big fitness advantages in some of these novel environments. And while IRA1 didn't display this pattern, mutations to another gene, PDE2, do display this pattern. And so what you're starting to see is that some of these fitness profiles are similar and some of them are different. Oops. To figure out how many fitness profiles there actually are, we need to um, use a clustering algorithm. But before we apply it, we need to actually divide our environments up. And that's because our key question isn't just how many phenotypes are affected by this collection of mutants, but it's whether there are some phenotypes that matter very little to fitness in the original glucose limited condition, but have strong latent effects in novel environments. So we need to divide our environments up and decide which ones represent subtle perturbations of the original glucose limited condition. We call any environmental perturbation subtle that cause fitness deviations of less than two standard deviations from the average across nine replicates of the original glucose limited condition. But the main results I'm gonna show you are insensitive to that choice of cutoff. So we applied our clustering method called singular value decomposition or SVD to data from the 25 environments that we called subtle perturbations. SVD infers the number of phenotypes that must be collectively affected by this group of mutants to explain the variation in their fitness profiles. We call these inferred phenotypes phenotypic components because in, in a way they're not really phenotypes, they're not things that you measure. They represent causal effects of mutations on fitness. SVD also infers the weight of the contribution of each one of these phenotypes to fitness in each environment. Now, some of the phenotypic components that SVD captures are going to represent noise. And that's because our fitness measurements, just like any measurement, are not perfect. There's some noise in our measurement. And so we needed a way to tell which phenotypic components are capturing signal versus noise. What we did is we permuted our data such that all that was left was noise, and then we ran SVD. And this helped set our limit of detection. So in our real data set, any phenotypic component that captures more variation in the fitness profiles than these noise components, we're going to say is capturing meaningful signal. It's my office, I've turned off, back on. Okay, so the first phenotypic component we detect captures a ton of the variation in these fitness profiles, 95% of it. And that's not that surprising if you look at the shape of the fitness profiles across the 25 subtle perturbations, there's not much of a shape, they're kind of flat. So the biggest difference between them is actually their height. And that's what this phenotypic component is capturing, differences in average fitness. 
So if you imagine kind of subtracting this phenotypic component and collapsing those profiles onto one another, now you can ask, what's left? Is it meaningful gene by environment interactions or is it noise? And so we seem to find that it's meaningful gene by environment interactions. We find seven additional phenotypic components that capture more variation than do our noise components. Now, some of these capture very little variation. So let me try and convince you that they're actually capturing biologically meaningful signal. The seven smallest components, and to a lesser extent, the three most minor components, are able to cluster the mutants by gene. And this was really surprising to me in this particular case because GPB2 and PDE2 are negative regulators of the same pathway. I really thought mutations to those genes did the same thing. And that they, they clearly don't. If you have the fitness profile for a mutant, you're able to tell whether that mutant is in GPB2 or PDE2. Even if you only have the fitness profile for how its fitness changes across very subtle perturbations of the original glucose limited condition. And so I thought that was really cool because it means these mutants have different effects that matter in different environments. Um, and also hopefully it convinces you that these components are not capturing noise, but are capturing real biological signal. All right, so now I wanna move on to the question of some of these phenotypic components, whether they don't matter very much to fitness in the original glucose limited environment, but they do matter a lot in novel environments, whether they have strong latent effects. So to answer that question, what we can do is add back the more different environments to our model. And the way that we do that is we use SVD to find eight weights that describe how each of our eight phenotypic components contribute to fitness in each new environment. This is really tricky because we can't add phenotypes to the model. We only have these eight to work with seven of which barely matter to fitness in the original glucose limited condition. So it wasn't really clear to me whether we were going to be able to use these eight components to describe or predict fitness in novel environments. And so you definitely can't use a one component model to predict fitness in novel environments. Let me show you those data first. So here what you see is that with a one component model, you get pretty decent fitness predictions across the settled environments but terrible predictions in new environments. These predictions are actually negative because mutants that do the best in the glucose limit environments sometimes do the worst in the novel environments. So if you say, oh, you're doing great here, I predict you'll do great here, you'd, you'd be wrong. Now when we add back more complexity to our model and try a four or an eight phenotype model, we see the predictions are better. Let me zoom in on this for you. So, Here's an example of an environment where the one phenotype model makes poor predictions, but the other models make better predictions. This is an environment where we increase the amount of glucose and change the shape of the flask to one that better oxygenates the media. And what you can see here is that every point is a mutant and you can see the measured fitness for that mutant doesn't really match its predicted fitness using a one phenotype model. But when we use more complex models, we see a better match between measurements and predictions. And so what that's telling you is that these minor phenotypic components that contributed very little to fitness in the original glucose limited condition are more meaningful in this environment. They matter more and you need to consider them. Here's another environment where we change the time it takes to replenish glucose from 48 to 24 hours. We call this the one day condition. Here you can see both the one and the four component models are not a great fit, but the full eight phenotype model is a much better fit. And so what this is telling you is that some of those very minor phenotypic components that don't matter much to fitness in the original condition contribute more strongly in this condition. So I hope you can see this even more clearly on the next graph. So this is showing you the improvement you get in the fitness prediction when you add each phenotypic component. And you can see when you add that seventh component, you get a big bump in your fitness accuracy in the one day environment, but not in the other environment, the 1.8% the glucose. So this is showing you hopefully very clearly that some phenotypes matter more to fitness in some environments than others. So there is indeed this, what we call latent phenotypic complexity. Okay, now you can ask a key question. Are all of these mutants the same 
or do some of them influence phenotypic component seven while others do not? And it looks like only a few mutants affect phenotype seven such that their fitness prediction improves in the one day condition upon including phenotypic component seven. So you can see the fitness prediction for GPB2 improves substantially, predictions for SSK2 improve, but predictions for these other three classes of mutants don't improve too much. And so to wrap this all up, I think what we found is that adaptive mutants do affect a small number of phenotypes that matter to fitness in the environment in which they evolved. They also affect a bunch of other phenotypes. So there's latent phenotypic complexity, and this complexity can be revealed upon changing the environment. And what this all means, what I've been telling you, is that it means things are a little less predictable. It's, it's difficult to predict that all of these seemingly similar mutants in GPB2 and PDE2 are gonna behave the same way when you change the environment. In fact, they're not gonna behave the same way. So predictions are hard. And so this whole time I've been kind of telling you, context dependence makes prediction harder, but I don't think it's yet time to be pessimistic. I think predictions are still possible. And so I actually showed that here. We flipped the problem on its head and by embracing the idea that context dependence was there, we were able to build a more complex model that made better predictions. And so to me, the take home message um, was that we need to study context dependence a bit more, understand how much there is, what it looks like and build models that include it. And so to summarize both projects that I told you about, I told you that there's a lot of pliotropy in the genotype to phenotype map, but that predictions are still possible, especially when you embrace the idea that the impact of genetic change can depend on context. And so this context dependence thing is something that I guess I was surprised by and excited by, and it's what I'm focusing on in my new research lab at ASU. And so some of the projects we have ongoing look at how gene regulatory networks cause mutations to have impact that depend on context, in particular, uh, impacts that depend upon what other genes in the network are doing. We have another project that looks at how the toxicity from misfolded proteins depends on how much the proteome is already in a misfolded state. And we have another project that tries to use what we know about context dependence to build better evolutionary traps. Now, I'm excited about all these projects because I think a lot of what I told you about was pretty abstract, sometimes so much so that it's hard to communicate why it matters. And I hope that all these three projects represent sort of tangible cases where context dependence really matters in terms of understanding biology. So stay tuned for more about these projects. And with that, I'd just like to um, thank everyone again who did this work with me. So the first project I told you about is something I worked on with Mark Siegel at New York University. And the second project is something I worked on with Grant Kinsler and Dimitri Petrov at Stanford. And then last, I'd like to thank uh, all of the people in my new lab at ASU for studying context dependence with me. And also all of you for listening to me talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Does anyone in the audience have a question in the next few minutes? Yes, Andreas. Yeah. So really fascinating talk. And um, I, I have a lot of questions, but I think maybe I'll boil it down to one that I was most interested in. I mean, I guess I'm, I usually work myself in multicellular organisms, so mammals, vertebrates. And one thing that, you know, we, you know especially with something like mice that we need to um, uh, really keep in mind is variability that even in one condition, a particular mutation can have multiple different effects or that it might have a range of effects under different conditions. I'm, I'm curious if you see anything like that or if kind of the system that you're working with is reproducible enough that you have less of that to worry about. I mean, I know there were some error bars and different points in different spots, but I didn't have a sense if that was just due to maybe differences in measurement, or if there is some real variability that creeps in in response to the mutations? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there is a lot of that. And in a way, some of that is almost what I'm calling context dependence, 
So in the first project, I told you that we wanted to measure these inherent correlations between traits. And we ran into this issue where some of them didn't make sense. Like some traits that had to be correlated for geometric reasons were not coming out correlated. And we realized that what was happening is exactly what you're talking about. So in yeast, as they're growing in their little flask, they're going through the cell cycle and they're in all these different states of the cell cycle. And that variability caused huge differences in the correlations between traits. So one like sort of easy one is when yeast bud, they, um, there's a, something called the bud neck that separates the mother and the bud cell. And so bigger cells sh should have bigger bud necks. But as cells are dividing, when they first make the bud, the bud starts out infinitely small. So there's no correlation there until it gets big enough to have a correlation between cell size and bud neck size. And so we only saw that when we realized there was variability and were able to partition cells into bins based on what state of cell division they were in. And so, yeah, I think what you're saying is, is really important and, and it's exactly what I'm talking about, but I'm trying to, to use maybe a different language. I'm saying these contexts, these states are, con are just contexts. And I know sometimes variability is not Binnable, so it might be really difficult to to work with. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Badoy. Hi, from your first project where you were looking for mutations across uh, various strains, did you notice that the mutations were towards coding or non-coding regions of the genome? So. In the first project, when we looked for QTLs, um, I did spend some time trying to, the QTL is a big region of the genome. So of course I want to know what's the mutation that does it. And that's, that's surprisingly hard to do. So I was able to narrow them down to a single gene in some cases, but basically what you have to do is these gene swap experiments where you, you're like, I think it's this mutation that's responsible. So I'm gonna put the one in the wine strain into the oak strain and see if it works. And it doesn't always work perfectly because there's things like epistasis. So, and also this was slightly before CRISPR. So it was kind of hard to do that. So in that case, I don't fully know, but in a part about spontaneous mutations, we were able to see that MA lines that possessed a mutation that seemed to change the trait, trait, the trait correlation, they did have mutations in coding regions. And not all the MA lines had those. So it was nice to see, okay, we see an effect and this line happens to actually have a mutation that could give an effect. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Uh, a bit, yes. I'm working on the, the idea that non-coding regions are less deleterious. So you might have more genetic com complexity. Uh, you might encode more genetic variability of you know, what you see the phenotype rather than more deleterious protein coding. And I didn't know if that was what you could see in that data. I see. I don't know if I could see that, but I'll think about it. Thank you. Vaughn? Thanks, I'll, I'll be quick, cause I know we're, I think I'll be running into your spot, your meeting spot. And, and Carrie, that was uh, just, you know, like a warm, cozy blank of, blanket of pleiotropy, I appreciate it. But I, what I really liked are that it was your distinguishing um, horizontal and vertical pleiotropy. And so the question is, do you, have, do you see any surprising examples of horizontal pleiotropy from known mutations, say that that's, um, Sandeep and others characterized um, in, that, in that sort of whatever middle paper? Uh, that are in one of the big pathways like RASPK or mTOR, where I guess you would think this is this super powerful hammer that is going to be really vertical because we know those that circuit so well, but actually you find it's 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 an example of horizontal. I don't think we've gone there yet, but that's a really interesting idea. So like in this in that project, I wasn't thinking about vertical versus horizontal. I was just thinking about are, are there latent phenotypic effects? Right. But you would think 
something weird is going on because like you say these mutations are kind of like a hammer they're affecting this pathway and just knocking it out basically they're saying cell don't bother sensing glucose just you're going to get more anyway right and so i'm sure they'd have huge pleiotropic effects and maybe vertical ones if that's you know all connected in some wiring diagram of how cells respond to glucose but if that's the case all the mutants should have kind of responded the same way it's all yep. the same hammer and they didn't so I think you're right. That does maybe necessarily imply there has to be horizontal pleiotropy because they're doing two different things. It's, they're doing the same thing. They're all interesting. I don't yeah, know. I, I, I love that. I think your, 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 that data, like your big data from that eLife paper suggests that there's more to learn about that pathway that has been, is maybe one of the best studied pathways and you know, in biology right now. So it's pretty cool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. it's like promiscuous effects of each of those genes, like not related to the pathway. Yep. Yep. Thanks. It's more than pretty cool. It's super exciting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for, for your seminar, for answering your questions. And uh, everyone, Thank you for coming to the seminar and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.